Back over to Hebrews chapter 8. <laughs> Amen. I think that's the first time that's happened. <laughs> this is where I was ministering from last night. And I just want to go over a couple of verses and then I'm going to go further into this. But it kind of summarized in Hebrews chapter 8 and in verse 13. And it's been talking about that there was a new covenant with new commandments and that the first covenant now was outdated. The old covenant is not how we are supposed to relate to the Lord. Last night I tried to make a major point that the way David prayed, take not your Holy Spirit from me, created me a clean heart. And all of these things is wrong. New Testament believers should not be praying that way because God has promised he would never leave us nor forsake us. He's always with us. You don't have to beg God to come and be with you. He's always with you. And so we went through all of this and talked about how we have a new covenant. And this summarizes it in Hebrews 8, 13, in that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. And so the old covenant, the old way of God dealing with mankind where he held our sins against us has been taken away and God has a new covenant. That is radical. You know, that'll get me kicked out of nearly any church. There's very few churches that will allow you to say this. I mean, it's just heresy. That's the reason we have to come rent a building like this (laughs) is because there's very few churches that'll let me in to preach these things. And yet this is exactly what it says. In that he says, a new covenant he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old, the old covenant, is ready to vanish away. And put this together with John chapter 13 and verse 34. And this talks about not only do we have a new covenant, but we have a new commandment. A new commandment I give unto you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples in that if you have love one to another. And I also use Matthew chapter 22 and Romans chapter 13 that talked about that love is the fulfillment of the law. Love is the greatest commandment of all. Everything else hinges upon us loving God. And so the New Testament is, has replaced the Old Testament. The New Covenant has replaced the Old Covenant. And we now have a new commandment to love God and to love people that has replaced the Old Testament law and the Ten Commandments. Not saying that there's anything wrong with the Ten Commandments. They still are the right thing to do. They are the revelation of God. And all of those things are true, but we don't live by it. And one of the points that I made last night at the very end of the session was talking about like the uh, commandment to honor your father and mother. Exodus chapter 20, verse 12, I believe it was. And if you don't honor them, Exodus chapter 21, verses 15 and 17 says you are to kill a child that doesn't honor their parents. If you smite your parent or if you curse your parent, you kill that child. Deuteronomy chapter 21 says if the child is stubborn and rebellious. I had a parent bring a child up this morning and say they're rebellious. If we were still living under the old covenant, we should kill them. And yet there's Christians that just want to hold on to this. No, we've got to still do all of these things. Well, you know, people who say that don't understand what they're saying. Look at this passage over in the book of Galatians chapter 3. This says that exact same thing. Galatians chapter 3. In verse 10, it says, for as many as are of the works of the law, this is talking about if you are trying to please God and appease God by keeping all of the commands of the law, that's what it's talking about. As many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. You know, this is a minor point. Really, it's a major point that people just conveniently forget. They say, I believe you've got to live by the Ten Commandments. I believe you've got to be holy. I've got to believe you've got to do all of these things before God will move in your life. 
Oh, really? Well, what do you do with this verse? It's actually quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 26, where it says, Cursed are you if you don't confirm every single thing that is in the law. James chapter 2, verse 10 summarizes it in the New Testament by saying it this way, If you keep the whole law and offend in one point, you become guilty of everything. You know, I have lived a relative holy life compared to most people. I've never said a word of profanity. I've never taken a drink of liquor. I've never tasted booze. I've never smoked a cigarette. I've never tasted coffee. I know some of you are thinking coffee. (laughs) I'm not saying coffee's comparable to booze. You got a scripture to stand on for drinking coffee. It says you can drink any deadly thing and it shall not harm you. Amen. (laughs) I'm just saying I've lived a separated life. I've lived holier than most of you have ever thought about. And yet, did you know the Bible says if I keep everything and only miss it in one point, I become guilty of all. I am guilty of murder, adultery, homosexuality, lying, stealing. Even though I haven't done those actions, I'm guilty of them because I have been selfish and I haven't put God first and I haven't loved my brother the way that I should and all of the other things. I know that most people don't think that way, but that's what the Bible says. And again, this is saying here in Galatians chapter 3 verse 10, it says, as many of you as who want to live under the law... He says, it is written, cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. And people just conveniently miss this point and think, well, I know I'm not perfect, but I'm doing the best I can. I'm doing better than this. And that leads, see, to comparison. That's when they start saying, well, I'm better than this publican over here. I fast twice in the week. I pay tithes of mint and anise and cumin. And we begin to start comparing ourselves among ourselves. People who believe that God demands you live holy and do these things before he will answer your prayers. There are always people that compare themselves with others and are very judgmental and condemning of other people. But when you understand that you don't deserve it, You don't deserve the things of God. Well then, and if you receive it by mercy, then you know what? It makes you merciful to other people, even people who maybe haven't done as well as you have done. But you realize that God didn't give you justice. He gave you mercy. Amen. You don't need justice. Some of you think, oh, yes, I do. Again, you're comparing yourself with other people and you're looking, feeling very good about it. But you know that if you compare yourself to Jesus, we've all come short of that standard. And you just need to cry out to God for mercy. And see, the Old Testament law basically said, you do this and this and this, and then I'll do this. And so it was a barter system. You live holy and you keep this law and this law and this law, and then God does this. And sad to say, most Christians are still living with that mentality today. But that is not for us. We have a new covenant where it is all based on what Jesus did for us. And you access everything by what Jesus did. You just put faith in him and you have it counted unto you for righteousness. Look over in Romans chapter 8 at a passage of scripture that many people quote, but very seldom do we really live by this. There is therefore now, verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. You know, some people take the phrase there at the end of the first verse and basically just negate the whole point that he's making. And they say, because it says, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. This is talking about you've got to be holy, and if you aren't holy, well, then there is condemnation to you. That's not what this is saying. Walking after the flesh and after the spirit is just talking. If you go into this chapter, it's talking about that if you are walking in the new covenant, if you are standing on the New Testament realities of who you are in Christ, instead of standing in your own self-righteousness, there is no condemnation to you. This is not saying that you've got to be holy and that your holiness is tied directly to your performance. The first part of that verse says that there is no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. And the word no there is an absolute negative. It means zilch, zero, nada, absolutely none. 
no condemnation. And condemnation is a religious word that doesn't relate to most people, but here's my little layman's definition. Condemnation is just that feeling of unworthiness. It makes you unfit for use. You know, if you condemn a house, what that means is that that house cannot be inhabited. It's unfit to be occupied. It's condemned. And likewise, when you feel condemned is when you just feel like that, God, how could you ever use me? How could you answer my prayer? You know, there's many of you that you, you've heard me talk about that God has done miracles for me and my son was raised from the dead and miracles have happened. And you come and you think that God will flow through me. You believe that God can do miracles and if I will pray for you, you can be healed, but you don't believe it'll happen for you because you are condemned. You may not have put those two things together and connected the dots, but that's what it really amounts to. You know, this is a Friday morning and you're out here at a venue listening to me. You are either a fanatic or you were drugged here by a fanatic. (laughs) You are the people who, you aren't your nod to God crowd that just shows up on Sunday morning. You guys are seeking after God. You believe in the supernatural power of God. You believe in miracles. And when I tell you about we've seen miracles and God does things, most of you, amen, man, you're right there with me. You, you believe it. If somebody was to fall over dead here, you know, we just had a guy last month died during our uh, Bible college in Colorado Springs. He died and the class just got around him and prayed for him and raised him from the dead. And he was just at our campus days. If any of you saw our campus days on uh, TV, I had some people tell me that they watched that. Uh, He was there at the meetings and he was up praying for people and ministering to people, raised from the dead just a few days ago. I talk about that and people say, hey man, I believe that stuff happens. And if somebody was to die right here, and if I said, how many of you believe God could raise him from the dead? Well, most of you would be right there with me. You'd gather around, you'd want to see it. See, you believe in those things. You're the fanatics. But you know where I could lose most of you? I say, all right, if you believe it, you come pray for him. <laughs> now think about this. Well, you don't doubt that God can do it. You don't doubt that it happens today. You believe in all of this power, but then when I say you pray for him, all of a sudden your faith turns to fear. Your excitement turns to dread. What happened? What changed? Did God change? You know what the difference is? You, most people live with a sense of condemnation, a sense of unworthiness. You don't doubt God's ability. What you doubt is God's willingness to use his ability on your behalf because you know that you haven't done everything that you should. You knew you should have been praying more. You should have been studying the word and doing all of this. And most of us believe God is giving us what we deserve, that he moves in our life proportional to our goodness. That is an Old Testament mentality, and that is the very thing that's keeping you at arm's length from God. It's not God who has pushed pushed you away. It's you that pushes God away because you think, oh God, I know I'm not worthy. And you can't believe that God would move through you. And that is what the Old Testament law did. But for those of us that are in Christ Jesus, there is absolutely zero, not a zilch, no condemnation for those of us who will access God by the spirit instead of trying to get it through your own performance, the flesh. If you were to stand in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation. A scripture that I'll be using more as we go through this series this week is Hebrews chapter 10, verse 2. And it says that you should have no more conscience of sin. You should not even have a sin consciousness. You shouldn't even be aware of sin. And yet the average Christian is constantly aware of sin, constantly doing an inventory and constantly measuring, God, am I worthy? God, would you accept me? Have I done enough? We live in sin consciousness, and that is a product of the Old Testament law. Romans chapter 3, verse 19, the by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law points, it focuses your attention on every imperfection and every uh, fallacy in you. 
It's similar to when we raise children. If you just nitpick at children and every time they do something wrong, that's wrong. You didn't say this right. You didn't do that right. And if all you do is point out everything wrong that they do, did you know that that kid will become either an overachiever thinking they've got to be perfect to earn people's uh, approval or they will become rebellious just thinking I can never live up to this standard, therefore I reject them all. And we don't do that with our children. We shouldn't do that with our children. Well, in a sense, that's what the law does. That's what religion has been doing. And it just makes us so condemned and unworthy. I've heard a statistic before that I assume is correct because I know a lot of people who live this way. But I've heard a statistic that 70% of all spirit-filled Christians don't even go to church. I'm not asking you to raise your hand. But if I did ask you to raise your hand, I bet you there would be hundreds of spirit-filled Christians in here who love God who don't go to church because you're just tired of being beat up, tired of being condemned, tired of being told that you got to do all of this stuff and you're just tired of it. That's not the way it should be. There are good churches and it's worth the effort to find one, but I'm saying that we have a lot of people today that are just burned out on religion. They're tired of playing the games. And you know what? It's not the new covenant. The new covenant isn't like that. It's the religious system that we have operating in this country. It's what killed Jesus. There is no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. If you will quit trusting in your own flesh and your own holiness and instead depend upon who you are in Christ Jesus, there is absolutely no condemnation to you. And then it says in the next verse, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. What is the law of sin and death? It's the law that when you sin, you get death. It's the law that when you sin, instead of blessing, you don't get the good. You don't get your prayers answered. You don't get healed. You don't get prospered. Instead, you get cursed. God's against you. God's not going to answer your prayer. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. If you are in Christ Jesus, if you have been born again, you are set free from reaping what you've sown. You are set free from this law of sin and death. You don't get what you deserve. You get what Jesus deserves. Some of you are thinking, that just doesn't work that way. There still is a law of sin and death. It's like gravity. Gravity still exists when you're flying in an airplane. When you fly, that doesn't mean that gravity ceased to work. It's still there. You're just applying this greater law of aerodynamics, thrust and lift. And because of it, you're able to fly. But gravity is still there. And if you get outside of that plane, you will sink. (laughs) And if you step outside of Christ and if you quit trusting in Jesus and what he has done, and if you start relating to God based on your own goodness, there is still a law of sin and death. There is still a law of reaping what you sow. And you know what? You will sink. You will have Satan come against you. I'm not denying that there are consequences to actions, but I am saying that if you're in Christ and if you are truly trusting him, God has set you free from reaping what you deserve. Uh, sowed and getting what you deserve and all of these consequences. And instead you'll have mercy instead of judgment. Again, this is contrary to our religious message today because they say, no, sir, you get exactly what you deserve and you've got to earn it. And you've got to do all of these things or God won't answer your prayer. That's not what, that's not the truth of the word of God. And it goes on to say in the next verse, here's the reason that we have been made free from the law of sin and death for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. There was nothing wrong with the law. There was something wrong with us. None of us could ever keep the law. And so here's the reason that it wouldn't work. It was because the law was weak through our flesh. We couldn't keep it. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh of his son. God condemned his son. When Jesus hung on the cross and he said, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? That was a quotation from Psalms chapter 22. I believe it's verse two. And he quoted that verse, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? And the next verse explains why God forsook him. 
Because it says, but thou art holy, O God, that inhabits the praises of Israel. You know why God the Father forsook his son Jesus? Because Jesus became sin for us. He became sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21, for he made him who knew no sin to be made sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God. Jesus didn't just take a principle of sin. He didn't taste just a little bit of sin. Jesus became sin through and through sin entered into Jesus. Every act of homosexuality, lesbianism, murder, lying, stealing, every perversion, every wicked thing that the human race has ever done, all of that sin entered into Jesus and he became sin. And because of it, his father forsook him because that's what the judgment on sin was. His father forsook Jesus. He became sin and his father turned away from him so that he would never have to turn away from you. He put all of that sin upon Jesus. And Jesus bore that sin and suffered for us the judgment that we should suffer. And because of this, you should not be having condemnation over your sin. You shouldn't be feeling separated from God because Jesus has totally reconciled us unto him. It goes on to say in the next verse, Romans chapter 8, verse 4, here's the, here's the benefit of God condemning sin in the flesh of his son that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. The righteousness of the law. What this is talking about is holiness. Holiness is now perfected in me. I am righteous and truly holy. Not many people like that one. There's people look at me and think, oh, I could find some faults if I looked in you. But see, the problem is you're looking on the outside. The Bible says in John chapter four, verse 24, that God is a spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. God relates to you spirit to spirit. He doesn't relate to you based on your outside, how you look. That's the reason that color doesn't matter to God. He looks on your heart. That's the reason it doesn't matter if you're a male or a female. It doesn't matter if you're pretty or ugly. It doesn't matter if you're dressed fancy or anything else. God is looking at your heart. And when you get born again, God changes your heart. God looks at you in the heart. And Ephesians chapter four, verse 24 says, put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Your spirit is righteous and truly holy. According to this verse that you, the righteousness of the law is now fulfilled in you. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And people think, well, that's only if you're doing everything right. No, this is talking about walking after the spirit is talking about if you are standing in what Christ has done for you. If you are in this new creation. If you are relating to God through your born again spirit, you are in the spirit. If you are trying to earn God's favor by your goodness and thinking I've got to do everything so that God will be pleased with me, then you are in the flesh. Some people think, well, in the flesh is talking about sinful. No, you could have USDA choice flesh. You could have good flesh, but if you are in the flesh, you aren't going to please God. You can have religious flesh like mine that I haven't done most of the things that many of you have done. And yet nobody is ever going to be justified by your own effort and by your own goodness. It doesn't matter if it's good flesh or bad flesh. Who wants to be the best sinner that ever got sent to hell? Amen. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It's just talking about for those who are trusting in Jesus and what he has done. Or another way of saying it in the context of what I'm talking about is those who are now in the new covenant and basing their relationship with God on what Jesus has done and not their own performance and their own holiness. Those people have the righteousness of the law fulfilled in them. I'm as righteous as you can get in your spirit. Amen. Amen. I know some of this is messing with your brain. I go into these churches and I hear people praying, oh God, just make me righteous. And I think, why don't you get saved? 
because the moment you get saved, you are created in righteousness and true holiness. Ephesians 4, 24. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, I believe it is, or 31, that Jesus has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Jesus is my righteousness. And yet some people will quote from Isaiah chapter 64, I believe it is, where it says all of our righteousness is this filthy rags and they'll think I'm just unworthy and I'm an old worm. I'm just an old sinner saved by grace, but I'm so unrighteous. And we, we've been taught that that's a godly attitude. That's talking about your flesh in yourself. All of your righteousness is as filthy rags. But if you've been born again, Jesus is now your righteousness. And for you to say your righteousness is like a filthy rag is calling Jesus a filthy rag. We are under a new covenant and the righteousness of the law has been fulfilled in us who are not trusting in ourself and our performance, but instead are trusting in who we are in Christ, what Jesus has done for us. You are as righteous and holy and pure as you can get in your spirit. And yet most Christians don't know this. They don't understand the new covenant. And so they're saying, oh God, make me righteous. Oh God, I promise you that I'm going to start going to church. I'm going to pay my tithes. I'm going to do this and this and this. And now will you heal me? Bartering with God based on the flesh that's in the flesh. And you cannot please God. You've got to get to where you start putting your faith in what Jesus did for you. He was forsaken so that you would never be forsaken. He was condemned so that you would never be condemned. You do not have to have any sense of unworthiness and unrighteousness. God has set us free. The war is over. He placed all of his wrath upon his son, the Lord Jesus. Look in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 17 is a powerful verse. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I'm going to skip through this because I could preach on this for a week. And I want to get to some other verses. But man, you need to meditate on this. If you are in Christ, you are a new creation. Old things are passed away. It didn't say old things are passing away. Old things are going to eventually pass away. It's already happened. In your spirit, the transformation is complete. You don't need a new spirit. You don't need to get the word down into your spirit. You don't need to educate your spirit. Your spirit has the mind of Christ and knows all things. First John chapter two, verse 20. Your spirit's perfect. It's your head. that's the problem. It's this little peanut brain. We need to renew our mind with the word of God and then and that'll be two against three, two against one. Your spirit and your soul get into agreement. If you renew your mind, then your body just has to respond and it will be holy and it will act right, but it'll be a byproduct, not the way to relationship with God. And so it says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new and all things are of God who hath, past tense, reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. The word reconcile means to make friendly or to bring into harmony. Like when you take a guitar and you tune the strings together, you reconcile them to each other. You take a bank statement and here's your record of what you've got. Here's the bank's record and you reconcile the statements to where they come into harmony. They say the same thing. This is saying that you have already been reconciled unto God. You've been brought back into friendship, into harmony with God. God is not mad at you. God's not upset with how sorry you are. I'm not saying you aren't sorry. I'm just saying that God's not upset about it. God looks at you in the spirit and he sees you in the spirit as being completely righteous and holy. And the problem is you look in the mirror. And you think, man, this is holy. And you see zits and gray hairs and bulges and ugly and different things. And you think this is good. No, God's looking on the inside. 
If you worship God, you have to worship him in spirit and in truth. God's looking at you in the spirit, man. And in the spirit, you were created in righteousness and true holiness. As Jesus is, so are you in this world. First John chapter four, verse 17. You're holy and you're pure in your spirit, but you're looking on the outside and you can't see it. And so you wonder about how could God love me? And then you'll search your soul. You'll search your mind and your emotions. And you know, you hadn't been thinking right. You haven't been encouraged. You've been discouraged in all of these things. And you think that that's the way that God looks at you. God looks at you in the spirit. And because of that, you have already been reconciled. You are in harmony. You are in tune with God in your spirit. Boy, that's powerful. I'm trying with everything I've got not to teach on spirit, soul, and body, but it's... That's what changed my life when I found out who I was in the spirit. I'm trying to stay focused on the new covenant and the old covenant, but man, it all has to do with your spirit. It's only because you're a new person in the spirit that you can be exempted from the Old Testament law. And now you relate to God totally based on who you are in the spirit, your faith in Jesus. And God is not holding your sins and iniquities against you. He's not imputing sin unto you. So it goes on to say in the next verse, to wit, that is to know that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. How is it that God reconciled us, made us friendly, brought us back into harmony with him? It was because he didn't impute our sins unto us. Let me just say that this is the difference between the true gospel and religion. Religion will always impute your sins unto you, hold sins against you. True gospel, true Christianity, your sins have already been imputed to Jesus. And he will not impute them to you. The word impute is an accounting term and it means to put on the books or to, you know, like record. Used to, you'd go in and you'd tell a a clerk, you know, at the store, say, just put that on my tab. And they kept a tab. And then at a, you know, a certain time at the end of the month or whatever, they would impute this unto you. They would send you a statement saying you owe so much for groceries or whatever. That's what the word impute is talking about. The, what we would compare this to today, this is comparable to a credit card and you take a credit card. And when you give a credit card to a, a person at a business, did you know that they did not charge you for that. You haven't paid for it just because you gave them your credit card. All that credit card did was give them your information so that they can impute it unto you. And if you don't believe that, well, then when your statement comes, when your credit card statement comes, don't pay it and say, Hey, I already gave them my credit card. I've already paid for this. I'm not paying for it again. Do that and see how that goes over with your credit card company. When you give them a credit card, you did not pay for it. What you did was give them the information so they could impute this to you, so that they could hold it against you, so that they could send you a bill and tell you how much you owe. And you have to pay that bill later when it comes. And so this word impute, this is what it's talking about, that the reason God was able to make us friendly with him again is because he did not impute or even record your sins against you. He instead imputed them unto his son. It would be like if I was going to pay for something and I started to give my credit card and Jesus just walks up and pulls my hand back and says, here, put that on mine. Impute that to me. And you know, you might think, but this isn't fair. This is something I was getting. You don't need this. This is something I was buying for myself. And he says, no, I want to pay for it. And so he pays for it. And if he goes ahead and gives them his information, and if they impute that to him, then it would be foolish on my part to think, well, I still ought to do something. After all, I'm the one that got this thing. And so I'm going to at least pay some of it. Let me at least give 10%. Let me give 15 or 20% because after all, I'm the one that got the flat screen TV. I'm the one that's using it. And Jesus is paying for it. This doesn't seem right. You'd be crazy to do that. If Jesus had it imputed to his account, you shouldn't even have anything. If they send you a bill and say, well, somebody else is paying, but you know what? You've got to pay some charge because you're the one that got the good. So we're going to charge you 5% uh, service fee. 